Morning YouTubers, how are we doing today? It's a uh, let my hair down kind of day here. It's a Saturday in the upper Midwest. It's a cool morning. We got some rain overnight, might get more later today. Uh, it's supposed to hit around 70 degrees here Fahrenheit, which is fairly warm for April, but uh, <clears throat> it's only gonna last a day, so you, uh, you can survive the heat for a day. Uh, and that's not heat, it's just, when you're coming out of winter, I don't want that sudden switch to the warm muggy. I want, I want fifties and sixties for a while. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about something that I think might be useful to some people, and it's how to buy records from Japan. <clears throat> and the thing you don't want to do when you buy from Japan is buy one title. Okay, don't buy one record because the shipping is going to almost double your cost. And it's going to be uh, not a very wise investment. You know what I mean? You can, you know, and I've done it, but it's not to be done. Uh, <clears throat> I want to first of all say the Japanese are essential places for us to collect jazz records. And as vinyl went out of favor here and as jazz lost its audience in America, jazz only grew in popularity in Japan in the 60s, in the 70s, into the 80s. And in the 70s, they started some really great reissue programs. And <clears throat> I've talked to you a lot about the new wave of reissues here in North America. You know, the Tone Poet, the Crafts, the Universe, all the stuff that's coming out right now. The Verve, uh, Impulse stuff. But it's a small, small fraction of the jazz canon. It's very specialized, the essential titles, the kind of commercial saccharine ones, or the more out ones, which also will get collectors out of their beds to go buy them. If you want to get a much better idea of what the jazz canon looks like, the Japanese will give that to you. The Japanese have issued such a large percent of the jazz canon that in some ways it's almost as good a definition of what the jazz canon is as there is. Uh, labels like Blue Note, Prestige, Riverside, it's a high percent, all the Blue Note stuff, most of the Prestige stuff, maybe save some of the later titles, most of the new jazz stuff, like I said, Jazzland, uh, Emerson, important titles, Contemporary, Pacific, uh, one of the only places to get reissued Savoy is Japan. Uh, Europe's actually done a few Savoy titles. Uh, it's a great place to get a bearing on how broad the canon is. They've done some Argo titles out of Chicago, less there than maybe some of the other labels. Uh, and a lot of the Argo titles are fairly obscure names, which kind of also is a measuring stick of what's in the canon and what's not in some ways. And there's a lot of great stuff that got recorded in the 50s into the 60s that doesn't make the canon it didn't become part of the vocabulary enough for it to have longevity which doesn't make those records not valuable they're still important pieces uh it's like saying oh we don't want to read the red sea scrolls because it's not official canon uh, that can actually inform the canon it can actually tell you a lot about the legitimacy of what you claim to be the canon you know uh so there's a lot of value in non-canonical jazz and the definition of what's canon and what's not is very open for debate in some ways the broader your knowledge goes the broader the canon becomes to you you know so to me a guy, a guy like scott baldwin the canon's universally big to someone who's a beginner it feels like it's a few miles a few coltrane a few monk and a few mingus you know it's it's there's a very different definition there and if you went by the modern reissue programs you're going to miss about 90% of the jazz canon. And it's getting better. They're putting more and more stuff out all the time. Uh, they're doing them in fairly limited runs. And it seems like the more our records in demand, the smaller the, the, the pressing amount tends to be, which is also kind of counterproductive. But it's, it's protecting the cost of the records. And uh, it's protecting the value of the old ones to some degree as well, I think. Uh, if you flood the market with too much of it, you bottom out the prices for that release. And so a lot of stuff's being re reissued 
in fairly small quantities where the demand scoops up every pressing in the first few days, hours, weeks. And in essence, you didn't even relieve the tension on that title. You kept the demand high. And I, of course, money rules the day as it always does. But if you want to get a much better, broader definition of what the candle looks like, uh, the Japanese are a great way to go. And you can access that several different ways. Discogs, when you look up records, will often, will almost always give you uh, most of the major releases of jazz records in in the in the descriptions. You know what I mean? If you go to that spot, it can say all editions of this record, and you can scan through the original American releases, the stereo release when it came out, uh, early Japanese, European, fresh sound, whatever labels you got. Modern reissues will be listed as well. And that's more if you're looking for a specific title and you look it up and you're like, oh man, there's nothing in America uh, of that original pressing. And there's two original pressings and they're 400, 800 bucks. And a lot of those original expensive America pressings tend to be in places like Italy and Spain and Germany and Switzerland. And uh, even Japan has a lot of real American pressings. Uh, if you don't know about this in the 80s and 90s, a lot of Japanese record stores came over to America and bought up pallets of American vinyl, not just jazz, all kinds of vinyl. As vinyl was kind of going into disuse here in America, the price just plummeted and the Japanese recognized the value of that stuff. And they bought it by the container ship. Like it's just, just tons of American vinyl got shipped over. And then almost every long-term record store owner I know or have talked to can remember these Japanese guys coming in and buying just boxes and boxes of stuff. Uh, stuff that had no demand whatsoever here in America. Uh, whether it being uh, something we never thought would come back, something that we thought was just cheesy and corny. But the Japanese knew that a lot of stuff was going to have value and they were had a lot of high, uh, foresight in that. So a lot of great American records do exist in Japan. You can buy Jap American pressings from Japan. So the other great way to look for Japanese pressings is to search the individual title itself, whether it be Discogs or eBay. And you'll often find, especially for in-demand records, the Japanese pressings will have decent prices on them. And sometimes they'll even have buy it now auctions that start really low. And that's what you wanna look for. I'm gonna start off by talking about face records I think they have a couple locations in Japan. I know there's one in Tokyo for sure. And there's one in New York nowadays as well, which I bought a few records from. The New York store seems to be kind of small and they don't have nearly the inventory that the, the Tokyo store has. Uh, and I'm guessing the Tokyo store is probably supplying a lot of the Japanese, a lot of the New York store location stuff. They're just shipping because the, the Tokyo store often has multiple copies of records and auctions are ending all the time. And the face site on eBay. There's a lot of records that will be buy it now price that are in the 30s, 30, 40, $25 range. And they're because those records have demand and the law will sell. But there's a lot of stuff that is at in the auction that starts off at $299, $399, really low numbers. And this won't work as well for really highly in demand titles. But when you start getting to that B and C and D tier level of jazz depth and knowledge and understanding in the canon, there's a lot of great Japanese records that if you're patient and observant, you can find them and win them at these auctions on, on a store like Face for really minimal pricing in comparison to what you would pay elsewhere. Uh, what usually ends up happening for me, I'm looking for a specific title that I want to plug in. I've determined that getting it domestically will be prohibitively expensive if I ever find it. And that's been the case with a couple of these records on in this buy. Uh, so I settle, I, I settle, I say, okay, I'm just going to buy a Japanese pressing of this record. I'm going to be fine with that. The Japanese, led by King and led by Toshiba and a few other big companies over there, have high quality pressings. They almost always replicate the original artwork, the original uh, label on the vinyl itself. They do a great job of replicating the look and feel and authenticity. Uh, not quite tone poet immaculate, but they do a great job. And the sound is always high, top of the mark, sound quality. Never had a bad sounding Japanese jazz record. 
and they were kind of renowned even back in the 80s and 90s. The, the Japanese pressings are uh, preeminent. And again, I'm not a super guy into the whole difference in sound quality between one pressing to the next. Uh, I don't buy a record so my speaker can tell me what's wrong with the record. I ride by a record to hear the music and hear what these the artists are trying to say to me. And I think a lot of times these guys are trying to go come. I've, I've heard them in the record stores talking to managers and owners of the record stores, just being kind of snobbish and uppity and saying things like, oh, I bought this pressing and then my speakers revealed the flaw and there was a, a hum and a buzz and a, just things that are imperceptible to most people. Their systems can pick out these little flaws and that's what they want to talk about. That's all they hear. And it's like, it's a way of saying how superior their systems are. And it gets a little nauseating at times. And I know most record store owners, a large degree of them, find audiophile people to be quite obnoxious and returning stuff because of a little ding in the corner or a small s split in the scene. And most of these record store owner guys are living uh, hand to mouth. Like it's, they're, they're barely getting by. And a lot of these records don't even allow them to do decent markups on them. And so to consume these guys' times with this minutia of returning and, and trying to find you the perfect, a lot of them just present it and then like wish they would go away. And I, I've heard many record store managers talk that way. I think that's part of what shaded my feeling towards them. And I, A, I've never been concerned about that aspect of it. I'm buying old records. And I, I don't mind a few imperfections. Even when I buy a new record, I'm not going to be like, oh my God, there's a, there's a ding on the corner of the sleeve. It makes it invaluable to me. I can't, I can't have that. So I'm going to show you the record I meant to buy last. But when I find a record I really want to buy, I'll go to a store like Face and I'll search for it. And oftentimes I'll have several copies of the titles I'm looking for. And, I'm, and they have a really great selection. They really do. From Coltrane and Miles to Blue Note to Prestige. There's just these auctions will have tons of great jazz pressings, often multiple copies of things. So you can find the stuff you're looking for in Japan. And your knowledge will grow exponentially because there's so much cool vinyl jazz wise that's available in Japan. And you can will help you redefine what the canon looks like. And so there's a lot of titles in there that you're gonna not know maybe necessarily. But if the Japanese bother to reissue it, it is of importance. It truly is. And I'm sure that goes true for the 70s and 80s and 90s jazz, which I know far less about. I'm a 60s and 70s guy and a 50s guy, obviously. So the first record I want to talk to you about is by the great Jimmy Forrest. And this wasn't the record I was looking for. But once I knew I was going to buy this one record, which I'll show you in a minute, I quickly searched what was ending coming up in the next few days and I marked a few other like watched a few other records that I'm like oh I wouldn't mind having that I'll take that I'll take a Japanese copy of that and that's one of the things you have to kind of determine in your own mind is how rare is this record going to be in America uh, am I willing to settle for a Japanese pressing some of the old verb titles that I'm looking for still from the early 81 8200 part of that sequence the North American pressings aren't that rare or that tough to find or that expensive and so I'm going to hedge my bet some and, and bid low on a Japanese title. Because I'd rather have the old verb if I can find it. Those old verbs sound great. So the first guy I bid on is, a, is a kind of a, one of those third, fourth tier legends. The great Jimmy Forrest. And he's a fantastic player. Uh, mostly on the tenor. Uh, he spent time with Basie. Uh, he's one of those guys that has a lot of rhythm and blues. Gospel in his sound. He plays very soulfully, uh, very, a lot, there's a moan, uh, uh, a pain. And the virtuosity is a byproduct of that. It's not the intention to be, look how great I am, look how much of a great player I am. My expression is just a release of my experience and my emotional state. And he plays very much from that place. He's not like this technically proficient acrobat. He's much more of just a... A gutsy player, which as I've gotten older, that's the jazz I'm looking for often. His work at Prestige and New Jazz is really worth seeking out as well. But Jimmy Forrest had a record on Delmark, the great little Chicago label run by Bob Costner, uh, called All of Gin is Gone. 
and I think it was recorded in the 50, mid 50s, I think it was recorded, maybe late 50s. And it's got Grant Green, Harold Mayburn, Gene Ramey, and Elvin Jones on it. So it's a great little record. It's got several different covers. This is the cover I could afford. The original cover with the gin bottle on, it's really rare and really expensive. And I've never come across it, to be honest. Uh, but there was a second issue on Delmark called Black Forest. And the first one was called All the Jane is Gone. And Black Forest was kind of stuff left over from that session that Delmark finally reissued numerous years later, to be quite honest. Uh, 404 was the first one. This one's 427. And Delmark's jazz release schedule was fairly light year to year because they're doing a lot more blues stuff than they are jazz stuff. So the 400 sequence grows quite slowly. So I don't think this one actually came out until probably late 60s, early 70s, initially on Delmark. Uh, I've never been able to find a copy of it affordably. And I found this in the Face Record store. And I knew that this had a chance to end at a decent price because a lot of times people are searching for Jimmy Forrest at a given time. And so I decided to watch it. And as bidding was ending, I put a decent bid on it and I won this record for $18.50. It's a great price for an old Jimmy Forrest on Delmark. Again, it's a Japanese pressing, but it's a great sounding pressing, uh, mint condition. They got the plastic sleeves and everything. And so these are the two Delmark uh, Jimmy Forrest records and I was able to get the second one very affordably. I was very excited about that The second record I bid on and I got, I did this bidding last week and they shipped this stuff DHL I literally got it four days later, which is incredible The second record I bid on I bid on a couple copies and didn't win this one And then there was a third copy which I bid on and I ended up winning this one for $3.25. And the original pressing had a blue cover. And some of them of these reissues have kind of this more purplish, pinkish cover. Uh, but the same uh, photograph. And uh, this is the great George Wallington, who was Sicilian born, but immigrates to New York at a young age, changes his name to George Wallington. He was a real fashionista, loved to wear fancy dress shoes, you know, fancy kind of designer clothes. That was kind of his thing even in school. And so we got the nickname Wallington as kind of this uh, bougie dresser with the, this flame and uh, style that he liked to possess. And so he, he adopted the name George Wallington as his jazz name. And this is the George Wallington Quintet at the Bohemia, a famous little New York landmark. And he's playing here with the great Jackie McLean, Donald Byrd, Paul Chambers and Art Taylor. You have pretty much a uh, Blue Note prestige quality session here. Uh, it was recorded in New York September 1955. And it's originally on the Progressive label, as you can see right there. And Progressive is a very forgotten about label. They have only, I think, two full length LPs. Uh, this one and the next record I'm going to show you, I think, are the only two full-length LPs Progressive put out in 55, 54. And then they went the way of the Dodo Bird. And then the label was actually resurrected in the 70s. And there's a lot of great titles on uh, Progressive in that 70s reiteration. And it's somewhat linked to the original and Progressive, but it's not the same entity. You know what I mean? Uh any more than Blue Note from the 90s is the same as Blue Note from the 50s. But before uh, the, the LP era dawned, in 53, 54, they do about four or five, 10 inches as well. So it was a pretty small imprint that made a couple pretty important and, and incredible recordings. I, again, this one's kind of the one that's been on my radar for a long time. I was kind of one of the blue ones, like the blue one's more original, but uh, Three dollars and fifty cents. Beautiful old pressing from Japan of the Bohemia George Wallington record. I was pretty excited about it. One of the ten inches that Progressive does is by the great guitar player. Tip my tongue. Oh my goodness. I've got to pause it for a sec. 
by the guitar player Chuck Wayne. And there's a great 10 inch right there for you. Chuck Wayne on Progressive Records. Uh, this is from 53 or 54. And Chuck Wayne's a very important guitar player. Uh, he codified and wrote down a lot of jazz chords and how to play jazz guitar. And was actually innovative in bringing some changes to how guitar on jazz was played. Chuck Wayne's a great player. His body of work's fairly tough to come by. He's got other great records out there. But this was a pretty cool thing to find. And believe it or not, this record's not that expensive, this 10 inch. You can find this for 20, 30 bucks. And so that's early 10 inch progressive. So again, these small labels in the cracks, especially that you can find Japan. And this is how extensive the Japanese reissue programs are. Like these, everything I'm gonna show you here is kind of in between the cracks, labels and artists to a degree, except for maybe the last two. But again, the Japanese have done it. It's over there. And I got this for $3.50 as part of this six lot LP bit I got. $3.50 for a great jazz record with, with Donald Byrd and Jackie McLean, was it? Tom Byrd, Jackie McLean, Paul Chambers, Art Taylor, and George Wallington. Three bucks, three and a half bucks. Great deal for a great record. Again, this is how you buy records from Japan. You buy multiple things from an auction, which will keep your shipping costs minimal. You can divide your shipping among six records, and the cost per record gets lower and lower. It's that initial shipping charge that kills you. But if you add four or five records, it only goes up a little bit incrementally from that point, and it really gives you access to getting a lot of really cool stuff for a decent price. Next thing I want to show you is uh, what ends up being a progressive LP number two. That was out number one, the Wallington. This is number two. This is with Hal Stein and a really forgotten player by the name of Warren Fitzgerald on the trumpet. And I stumbled on Warren Fitzgerald as a sideman on a few things. And I remember at first going, I don't know who this guy is. And then I did a little research on him. He's a really great player. And I've been kind of looking for this record for a while. And again, it's on the progressive label, as you can see. Progressive number 1002. Uh, Hal Stein's a fine player as well. Great, kind of West Coast cool, but also kind of cool bop, as, I, as I've coined that term. Uh, pretty modern. There's another great example of the progressive label, which, again, some are blue, some are orange, with that offset circle. Uh, this is a record I've looked at, I've been on a few times. The originals go for pretty good bucks. And you're not going to find an original for probably less than 80, 100 bucks, maybe more. And again, from Japan, I got this record for like $16 at auction. That was a real steal. So another small in between the cracks label was a label called Intro. And it's on the West Coast once again. And the first thing I discovered on the Intro label and found was this uh, collections record which is led by Red Norvo and Art Pepper with the great Joe Morello on the drums and Jerry Wiggins on the piano. We're a big fan of Jerry Wiggins. I guess there's no bass player because maybe Red Norvo can cover that on. No Ben Tucker's on the bass. And Howard Roberts on the guitar. Um, this is a great West Coast cool session with some elements of cool bop. You know what I mean? Some up-tempo numbers. Uh, it's just a great piece and it's again tough to find originals of this. They go for hundreds of bucks. Intro only had a few, I think three maybe jazz titles. And so I, when I was searching and learning about intro re records, I discovered there was another Art Pepper session on that label. Art Pepper Quartet. And again, Pepper's on that one as well. You got Pepper, Russ Freeman, Chuck Flores, and Ben Tucker. So a couple guys on the arm both sessions. Uh, again, mid-50s, a little small label. The Japanese got it covered. So these are the two intro records I got. There's only one or two other titles on that label that I'm interested in. A lot of these labels have kind of either 78 era or 10 inch 45 L, uh, RPM era. And a lot of these labels have only a few LP releases. Uh, and that's the case with Progressive. That's the case with Intro. Just these little, little small micro labels, but the Japanese have it covered. And I haven't even had a chance to listen to this one yet, but it's the great Art Pepper. Uh, one of the great players of the West Coast scene, one of the great innovators of Cool Bop, 
he really has a great long career and is an important player. And let me see what I paid for this. I don't remember. I paid $10.50 for this. And to be fair, the first one I tried to bid on, I think went near 30 bucks. But again, there's only so many people looking at these records at any given time. And a store like Face Records might have three or four copies of this ending in different auctions over the next few days. And so I actually bid on this record two or three times before I won this one for 10 bucks. And so all in all, I'm doing really good on my what I'm spending here. The next record I found was a record I've been on a few times and never won. It's got Winton Kelly, Paul Chambers, Jimmy Cobb, which of course is basically the Winton Kelly trio of 60s fame. They all left Miles Davis at the same time and went on to be one of the great trios of the 60s. They backed Wes Montgomery on some legendary sessions. They did a lot of records on their own. I'm a big fan of that Kelly Cobb Chambers group. And they were a group, I think, until Chambers passes in like 68 or 69 with Conti Condoli stepping in, a great West Coast trumpet player, and of course the great Art Pepper, once again. And this is the only one of these records that's on board of a bigger label. This is on Contemporary, which we've talked about quite a lot. Uh, this is like 35, 80 or something, like that, and that kind of later in the 3500 sequence. But it's a record I've wanted to buy for a long time, and I never wanted to pay big bucks for it. And I got this for $22. And so, again, some of these records, if you watch a store like Face, they have a lot of copies of these records, enough to open a store in New York. And so if you buy numerous pressings, numerous records from these guys and get your shipping costs in line, you can often win these records for really, really good prices. And so I got a contemporary Art Pepper record that I've wanted for a while. I've almost finished the first 100 contemporary issue titles. I think there's four I need to find. And three of them are kind of late Shelly Mann things, like one's an Andre Previn record. And so I'll, I'll buy those eventually. But uh, this was the this one and, and the, uh, the Good Gravy record I got a few weeks ago in Chicago. Those are the two big contemporary records I've been trying to track down. So I got that one for like $23. Now this was the record I was after. And this one has been elusive to me for some time. And I knew about Tommy Potter, uh, sorry, Walter Bishop Jr., uh, he's an important piano player in the bebop era, in the harbop era, but I didn't really know uh, him well enough until I made my trading cards, which I'm still working on, by the way. I'm approaching 400 of them complete now. Uh, I got burned out for a while. I had to take a break, but I'm kind of back into the flow of things now a little bit. <clears throat> but uh, Walter Bishop Jr., I realized, had a record on the Jazz Line, Jazz Time label, which is a little small label. Uh, I think it's out of New York, if I remember. And I have most of the things that they did. It's only like four or five titles. There's a great Duke Pearson record. Matter of fact, why don't I grab them and show you? So Jazz Line comes first. And this is the great Dave Bailey. What a record this is. This is tough to find again, a Japanese pressing. You have Kenny Dorham, Curtis Fuller, Frank Haynes, Tommy Flanagan, Ben Tucker. Serious, great hard bop R&B record. Uh, again, tough to find. 3301 was the first jazz time, I think it was, jazz line. And then the second one was the Duke Pearson, the Hush record with Donald Byrd, Johnny Coles. A great session. Tough, tough record to come by. And then there was a lawsuit of some nature. They had to change their name from jazz line to jazz time. And that's where this Dave Bailey Quintet Reaching Out comes from. Again, a great lineup here with Grant Green, Ben Tucker, Billy Gardner, and Frank Haynes on the tenor. And then this Walter Bishop is like number 002, if I remember. I have to look again. Because a lot of these are going to have Japanese numbers on them, uh, sequence-wise. So you have to kind of figure out what they are. But again, Jazz Time, Jazz Line is the same label. And this Walter Bishop had eluded me for a while. And I didn't even know about it for quite a while, honestly. It's just a name you don't hear quite enough of. And when I was doing my card for him, my trading cards, I was like, oh, he's got a record on Jazz Line. I didn't know that. And so I've been looking for it for a few months. And this record I've watched in Japanese stores. And I've been on it a few times over the last month and a half. But I've been kind of broke, so I don't want to spend money on records. So I kept my bids, you know, 
at the last few minutes, it's under six, eight bucks. So I bid 18 and I lost it. It went for 24. I bid 20 and I lost it. It went for 18. Like uh, most of uh, 24. I mean, a lot of times it was it was wasn't going super high, but I hadn't won it yet. And so this was the one I was really after, and I finally won this one for 26 dollars. And it's a great record again with a great lineup. With Walter Bishop, Jimmy Garrison, and J.T. Hogan. Uh, just a great piano player. Part of the scene that's kind of overlooked and forgotten. So once again, you're talking about these little small labels that the Japanese have reissued all of it. They're on top of it. And so we are talking jazz time and jazz line. A label like this. You want to go to Japan to try to find this stuff. Because you don't want to sit around waiting forever for the American record industry to reissue some of this stuff because they'll never get to some of it. And so if you want to find a way to get great jazz records, including the Blue Note catalog, the Prestige catalog, and I'll be honest with you, if you're trying to get old Mingus records on, you know, even from Japan, uh, even the Japanese pressings, the demand for some of those records is going to push those prices up. There was some Savoy stuff I bid on a few times back five, six years ago even uh, that I couldn't find in America. The Lee Morgan one, the Donald Byrd record, the Hank Mobley records. And I ended up finding original pressings on all of them and lost the Japanese auctions. But because those records were more in demand and Mobley's more of a bigger figure nowadays, even those Japanese reissues were going for 80, 90, 100 bucks, which I found surprising for Hank Mobley's message on, on Savoy. Not really one of his renowned sessions, even though it's a great session. So, you know, some of these Japanese records will get more expensive if the demand's there. But the Miles Davis stuff won't go, go too high because Miles Davis has been reissued everywhere forever. So there's a lot of pressings of it out there. So that's kind of the key. And, and I ended up getting six great records from Japan. They shipped them DHL. So I got them four days later. I think I paid $40 for shipping. And the six records themselves came to about a hundred bucks. So for $140, I got this incredible little stash of really great jazz titles that I've been, been seeking for each one of these. You know, each one of these is like the Jimmy Forrest. I've been looking for that for a while. The Wallington, I've been looking for that a while. Hal Stein, Warren Fitzgerald, both the Pepper records and the Walter Bishop. In fact, the Walter Bishop is the one that's most recent that I've been looking for. The other ones I've been looking for for quite a long time. They're all pretty tough to find on small labels. If the Japanese have it covered. And so it's a great place to go to build your collection. You can bid on numerous titles. The, the shipping will be bundled together. And they'll ship it to you quickly. It's not to wait like a month to get it, which I hate having to wait a month for something I, I purchase. I don't like that. So that, that prompt shipping is really is a key for me. So Face Records in a Tokyo is a great place to go to learn the canon, find stuff at a decent price, bundle it together, get it shipped over here. And there's far more titles available than what the domestic reissue programs are going to offer you. So even though it's record store day to day and you're all buying your residence records and your Bill Evans reissues and the Mingus stuff, the real canon is still sitting out there. This stuff's being added on to it. You're getting bonus episodes of a TV show that were never issued and if you don't have the full context of who these artists are, those records aren't going to have the same context. You're not going to understand what they really are about. You're not going to understand what Bill Evans, where he was in his career, unless you have Bill Evans' body of work. I think that's one of the real flaws in this reissue thing, where they're digging up live stuff and outtakes and stuff that was never issued for a consumer audience where a large chunk of it doesn't know the artist hardly at all. And so something like Monk at Palo Alto or... The live Coltrane, Love Supreme. If you don't have a bigger context of these artists, these records are going to be misinformed. I'm going to give you misinformation. They're going to mislead you in terms of who an artist is or what they were about. And <clears throat> rarely are these records being released today that never saw the light of day before. Rarely are they going to be one of the most important records that any of these artists did. <clears throat> They're usually noteworthy. They're usually. Uh, an addendum, something to add to your context, uh, outtakes, bonus scenes, lost episodes. That's what these are in that in, in a musical context. And it doesn't mean they're not of value, but you should always want to get the original works 
get to know an artist's canon, get to know what they were about, their stages of development. If you know an artist good enough, you might know that, oh, Bill Evans from the 70s is still great, but I'm not as interested in as I am in his 50s or 60s work. I love Monk, but I love 50 to through 56 Monk more than I love 60 to 68 Monk. And there is a difference in these guys' careers, where they're at with what they're doing. And if you don't have the context of their canon, their, their discography, these new issues, they're interesting. But don't get it twisted. These are the most important records these guys did. If you have three Monk records and two of them are new things that just got found, you don't really know Monk. And that's not an insult, because I think we're being misled by the record-buying industry. And obviously, some of it's about making money. And it's not a slight against these labels. You know, Residence is doing a great job putting stuff out. It's just if you're a beginner, you need to have a bigger foundation to stand on than just one or two of like an artist's big records and then a few modern vault pieces. Because you're certainly not going to have a very good insight into who, who an artist was with that limited a scope. So anyway, uh, all, all credit goes to those relabel issue guys. They're doing a great job. They're putting out great stuff. I have a lot of it. A lot of it's really good. Some of it's not so great. But it just needs to be put in its proper place. You know? So, that being said, buy with caution. Don't wait for the American market to reissue stuff because there's going to be a lot of great jazz that you'll wait for a lifetime to get. And as you see with what I bought in Japan, you can get these things from Japan for great prices especially if you're digging for kind of deeper artists. The Japanese put it all out there. So that's how you buy records from Japan. I got six great records for about $140, including shipping. And they're all fantastic titles, all things I'm excited about owning. They all kind of fill out. Uh, this was the last dull mark I was really kind of after, even though those other titles I will purchase. I think Jazz Time, Jazz Line, I have all except for maybe one thing which I'm, I'm mildly interested in. Uh, I have all the progressive LPs. There's a few 10 inches out there, which I don't have, including uh, they do a couple 10 inches by, oh, who was it? Someone of note, but I can't think of it off the bat. I have both the intro LPs now. I got a contemporary record that I really was after. So again, great stuff. You can find great stuff in great, high audiophile quality pressings. The Japanese do great work. And there's quite a uh, variance in between the prestige of certain Japanese reissues. Some of the King and Toshiba stuff is really high level uh, sound quality and really sought after and becomes more expensive. But there's still great deals to be had in Japan. And there's, there's a huge jazz following over there. They're buying and they're knowledgeable and they, they're collecting this stuff. And they're making it available to us in America, selling us back our music. And a lot of times even our pressings. More power to the Japanese. Our hats are tipped to you guys. You guys were smart. You saw it coming. But uh, great stuff. Great way to access and expand your knowledge of the canon. You can say if you're looking for one specific title and you find it at a Japanese store, search their store. See what else that you have that they want that's at a good price and especially if it's going to be auctions that start low you got nothing to lose by putting small minimum bids on records and have zero bids on them I probably bid on three or four other records that I didn't win but I bid really low on them just in case nobody bid on them and obviously I got the Wallington for three and a half dollars three and a half bucks and so there's there was some other verb titles that I bid on uh, I think a couple were uh, that was a Dizzy Gillespie one early that I don't have uh, a couple other things that were early verbs off Tal Farlow's. And I bid low on them because, again, I'd rather have the, the verve copies that are out there. I know they're out there. And I didn't win them. But I, I bid low. I didn't try very hard to win them, you know. And I think they actually, a lot of them went for, I think I bid five, six, seven bucks on some of them. A lot of them went for like seven fifty, right over what I bid. So that means that maybe one or two other people are even looking at those records. So there's great deals to be had in Japan if you know how to shop them. So this is a little tutelage on how to shop in Japan. And there's a lot of great stores in Japan. But I would start with Face Records on eBay. I think they're on Discogs too. I'm not positive. But Face has great inventory. And you can find a lot, a lot, thousands of jazz records in their store. And I said at least half of them are 
um, auction. And if you are watching for a certain record that nobody else happens to be looking for right now, you can get a great record for a great price. And it doesn't happen quite as much with the original pressings because a lot of those times, an original pressing, there's probably five guys on Discogs that have it marked as something they want. And so they're going to be sending emails saying, oh, this is available now. And so the price is going to stay high for that thing. But these auctions in Japan don't have that same option, especially via eBay. So you've got to be kind of diligent and look and search. And the Japanese don't make mistakes. They don't issue garbage. They don't do poor quality sonically wise. They re redo the original artwork almost always. So most of the things that you're looking for as a collector, the Japanese honor those things. So you can't go wrong. Uh, I do want to mention real quick that this is a fantastic Seattle supersonic Lenny Wilkins jersey from uh, their expansion season of 66-67. And Lenny Wilkins was a great player, a real floor leader. And he went on to become one of the winningest coaches, if not the winningest. He was the winningest coach for a stretch. He might have been passed by someone. But he was the guy who passed Red Arbog. This is the winningest coach in basketball history. A um, little bit of tidbit of information. Cool old Sonic throwback for sure. Anyway, be safe. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. We try to cover and talk about jazz in a deeper context here, more than just pressings and collecting. But sometimes we got to talk about that stuff too. So check out Japan. Tell me your stories in the comments below. Let me know how much you've bought from Japan and what kind of experiences you've had. Uh, outside of a few shipping things that happened during COVID where I had to wait for something for too long, I have really had not had a bad experience with Japanese records. You know, I mean, the grading of it's always been pristine. The, they always come in plastic sleeves. They always come, like, really meticulously packed and packaged and shipped. Great, great option for you as a collector. If you're looking for titles and you don't want to spend big bucks on the originals, you don't want to wait for them to be reissued in America, you don't want to stand in line at record store day for something, check out these Japanese stores. And there's a ton of them on Discogs as well. And so there you just search the title and you look and never, never buy one Japanese record because that $40 shipping is going to just kill you. You know what I mean? Buy four, five, six, and then the value will become, suddenly you're paying $6 shipping per record, which doesn't make it seem so unmanageable versus paying $35 or $40 for one record shipping wise. So anyway, that's today's issue episode. I appreciate you all. Uh, a lot of you didn't seem to care too much about the Ohio players. They're a great band. You should really check them out from my last episode. Uh, <clears throat> noteworthy. And they are definitely a descendant of jazz fusion, you know, without, without question. And they're more fun to listen to than a lot of the fusion-y, easy listening or out kind of edges of the music of, of the fusion era that happens in the 70s. Stuff like Earthman and Fire and Ohio players, that's fun to listen to. And people around you will enjoy that you put it on versus some dissonant fucking soundscape or uh, <clears throat> some schlocky uh, Hubert Laws that uh, feels like you should be shopping for furniture in some futuristic mall somewhere. And I like a lot of CTI stuff, don't get me wrong, but some of it can be fairly easy listening. So that's, that's all, I got, all I got for you today. Y'all be safe. Talk to you soon. Peace.